Well, as we begin, for any of our uh, students that are, I'm going to ask our students to stand, our high school students. I want you to stand for a second. High school students, please stand. Okay, you got one, two, three. Actually, we actually do have a real live MVP. Eugene uh, Bach is the, is the MVP of the of, of volleyball team. So don't be Toshimasa. If you're up at the net and you just he's going to spike it and smack you right in the face. So you got to be careful. But he's he's a star of his uh, uh, volleyball team, and him and Josiah are on the same team. But as uh, Sun Jin was was uh, you stand up too. All our all our uh, uh, Koden all our high school students stand up. They really are under a lot of pressure. And uh, if you would indulge me, I want to pray for them. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, we do uh, thank you for these that have come. Father, it's not easy to be teenagers. It's not easy to be in a demanding school like TCIS. And Father, as they seek your plan for their lives, you pray that you would lead and guide. That Father, that you would give them the health and energy they need to uh, do their studies. And that also they would make time for their own spiritual walk with you. And I just pray your special blessing upon them at this time. Help parents to understand and, and uh, accommodate them and, and serve them if they can. To just make these challenging days even more smoother for them. Lord, more than anything else, help them to have a heart and desire to want to know and do your will. And I pray that you would make your will clearly known to them. Father, bless them. Make this 2009-2010 school year just the greatest school year they've ever had. And we ask that you would just intend and, a guide, and, and, a, and, a guide, and guide them, Lord, as they, as they progress through the school year. Father, we commit them into your care now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, be seated. Clap for our high school students, okay? If you'll indulge me, I'm going to take you back to one of my uh, events as a uh, as a teenager and actually I have I'm, I want you to uh, just in your mind to journey back with me to three different points in my own experience that I want to share with you when I was 17 years old I went on a three-day fishing uh, I guess expo ex expedition uh, in the Gulf of Mexico now the southern part of the United States with Mexico on one side and Florida on the other and that that ocean area, it's called the Gulf of Mexico. And I went on a, a three-day fishing, uh, I guess, expedition there with some, uh, some older men. I was, a young, I was just a kid. I was 17, but my dad was going and some other folks, that, that uh, business people. And it was really, really, uh, just really wonderful the first night. The first night, we, we went out, and there we are in the middle of the ocean, and it was a clear sky, and you could not see land in any direction. And it was, it was just pure blackness with just the stars. And you could just sit there and look up, and you just felt like you're in the middle of, of a portrait or middle of a painting. And it was so, uh, so incredible, actually, one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. However, the next day, there was a storm that came. A very, very severe storm. And as I recall, I think this was a 28-foot vessel. And it, we were out in the middle of nowhere. And the wind was blowing, and the, the sea was so rough. And they call it the swells. And, the, and the, the, the boat itself, it was rising up and then suddenly crashing down. And it was just being tossed about. And it was like one of the, if you went to... Lote World or, or something like this, you would go to Everland and you would ride a ride and in the, the ship, it would, it would rock from one side to the other and one to the other and each time it would get a little bit higher and it would get so far and you felt like it was going to almost 90 degrees and you're thinking, well, what if it actually turned over in that situation? It was very dangerous. Some 10 years later, when I was 27, I was in Tanzania, East Africa, teaching at a school. And it was the Panghak, or it was the vacation time. And we, uh, we went to Serengeti National Park. 
Now that's where, you know, when you see all the zebras and the wildebeest and the gazelles and the hippos and the monkeys, that's where it was. And another uh, three days, I, I believe, of camping out there. And we were with uh, some students, some elementary school students, and, and we were, you know, walking around looking at everything. And you came to this one area in the Serengeti, and there was this huge gorge you know, we, we, we would say not a, not a cavern, but, but like a canyon. But, you know, it's green, and suddenly there's just a huge drop-off in the earth. And somebody had made a rope bridge, a rope bridge. had made a, There's trees on either side, and they actually had made, uh, you know, kind of like Indiana Jones movie or something. You know, you can see how to cross over. And, and everyone was afraid to go on that rope bridge but me. And it's not like it was straight. It's like it went up, but, you know, went up some trees and it was, it was curved some and then you go over and all this. And, you know, how old is it? How long has it been there? Are the ropes still strong? What about the wood planks that, that are, you know, in between that you walk on? And I went out there and it actually, it was kind of a foolish thing to do because if one of those wooden planks had broken, or if the rope had broken, I would be dead because it was such a huge, huge fall into that, that gorge. And again, it was a dangerous situation. A year later, I was working at a church in, in America, and we had what we would term be a work day where the men of the church would gather, and we would just basically, we would do things around the church, cleaning and doing things. That particular day, we were painting the church. And the church, the, the church was right next to the road. And the front, basically the front door of the church was right very near the road. And it was at the same level of the road. But as the church building went back, the ground gave way. And so it was level in the front, but then the ground went down. And we were actually painting the church that day. And I was, I was on the back side. And to, to actually reach the top of the church on the back side you had to have a very very long ladder it was actually a 28 foot ladder and and I was there and I had the ladder but the ground wasn't even so on the left side I just took some rocks or bricks and I put it there to even it out and then I went up the ladder and I had to go all the way up and I had to go to to actually paint where I needed to paint I had to go up almost to the top and I was holding on to the roof, the gutter, with one hand and stretching out and trying to paint with the other. And all the while, nobody holding the ladder, nobody there. The, the men of the church were too scared to do anything. And so, you know, I'm thinking if, if those rocks shifted at all, that ladder very easily could have slipped out and I would be in a, in a desperate situation. Okay, do you have those three scenarios in your mind? Okay, go back to the ocean now. What if the boat had actually capsized? What if it had turned over and I had fallen overboard? What would I want someone to do for me? Philip's mom. <laughs> what would I want someone to do for me? Uh, okay, somebody else. Lifeline, no? Not life jacket, come on, Luke. Okay, life preserver. Okay, life savers of candy. <laughs> okay, uh, a life preserver. And, and what would I have to do? I would have to cling on to that, right? I would have to hold that. That's what's going to save my life. I would cling on to that, and I would hope that someone would come and help me. What would happen if I was crossing the rope bridge there? And one of the planks as I was walking gave way, and I began to fall. What would I have to do? Come on, it's not hard questions here, guys. Okay, uh, well, I would grab onto, I would, I would hopefully grab onto a rope. I'd be hanging there. I would grab onto the rope or grab, grab onto another plank and hope that someone would come and help me. What about on the ladder? What if the ladder had given away? What would I do? I, hopefully I would be able to grab on top of the roof and hopefully uh, just hold on 
until somebody came to put the ladder back there to get me. The writer in Psalm 42, he, he brings up another image, another, uh, another setting that I'd like for us to look at. And, and on our PowerPoint, we have Psalm 42, uh, verse 1, and the start of verse 2. This is a way he, he creates another image. He says this, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirst for God, for the living God. As the deer pants for the water brook, well, what does it mean to pant? You and I, when we get hot, we, we sweat, okay? But when a dog or, the, that, or, or here a deer pants, what's he doing? He's releasing heat, but he's, he's hot, he's tired. He's, he's panting for what? The water brooks. The water brooks. The deer is running, He's running. What's behind the deer? What's he running from? Come on, talk to me. I'm, I'm lonely up here. Talk to me, Mr. McAllister. Talk to me. What's the deer running from? Okay, he's running from a lion. He's running from his enemies. He's running to avoid disaster. He's running to save his life. And he's panting for the water brooks. He needs the water to keep going. He needs the water to, so that he can continue to run and to save his life. He's growing tired. He's growing weary. And he needs the water to, to, to uh, keep going. And the psalmist says, he says, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul my soul pants for you, O oh God. My soul, what? My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. The psalmist is saying like the exhausted deer that he needs, he, the, the deer that's longing for water to keep going. He's, the psalmist says that his troubled soul, need, his soul needs God to keep going. He says, my soul is longing for God. My soul is thirsting for God, for the living God. I must have God to keep going. One of my favorite sayings is very simply, don't pray for an easy life. Pray to be a strong person. We, we, we want an easy life. You know, our students here, our IB students, if, if IB wasn't demanding and difficult, really the degree wouldn't mean very much, would it? But we, we, we want an easy life, but we're not going to get it because that's not reality. So instead of being unrealistic, be realistic. And say, in, 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 in with this little phrase here, agree with it, don't pray for an easy life. Pray to be a strong person because each one of us will face difficulties in our lives. And the challenges from, from being a teenager when you're in your teens to your 20s, to your 30s, to your 40s, to your 50s, to your 60s. At, all, it, at different points in our lives, the challenges are different. And so, like the psalmist is saying, he's saying, he's talking about, I need God. I need God in my life. What is he talking about? He's talking about relationship. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. It's not merely religion. We're not talking about religion here. You know, some people believe, well, it just doesn't matter, you know, what you believe. You just, as long as you're a good person and you're religious, you know, at its core, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Islam, Christianity, it's all the same. You know, just, just believe in something. All the roads, whatever path you take, you know, in the end, Majimak, they all, end, they all meet at the same place. It doesn't really matter. But folks, that's not true. If you went to, if you went to America in the federal highway system, in the roads that end in, uh, in even numbers, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, do you know what that symbolizes? What does it mean? The, hi the highways, right, it means east to west, east to west. The highways that end with an odd number, one, three, five, seven, nine, they go north-south. 
Well, I'm in, I'm in the southeastern part of the United States, Tennessee. Luke, he gets a good job and he goes back to California. I want to go see Luke. Well, if I get on I-75, guess what? I'm going to end up in Michigan. Luke's still over here. If I want to see Luke, I'm going to get on I-40 and I'm going to go all the way across and I'm going to go to California. You get on the wrong road, men and women, guess what? You end up in the wrong place. So this argument, well, believe whatever, all roads meet, you know, all roads meet somewhere. We're all, no, that's not true. Baskin-Robbins, you know what the, the um, slogan of Baskin-Robbins is, why it's famous? is because they, Baskin-Robbins became famous because they had more choices of ice cream than other places. How many choices do they have, do you remember? 31. 31 flavors. And so if you go to Basket Robbins and say, I want two scoops of chocolate almond. Hangamalo chocolate almond. They say two scoops of, uh, of, of chocolate almond. And then the girl gives you your cone. And you're saying, what is this yellow thing? Oh, lemon. lemon. It's lemon ice cream. One scoop of lemon. No, no, no. I, I ordered two scoops of chocolate chocolate almond. Oh, well, one scoop of lemon, you know, quinchanaya, it's okay. It's ice cream, right? No. I want chocolate almond. She gives you lemon. It's all ice cream, right? Doesn't make any difference. We're not talking about religion here. Jesus, mere, mere religion. Jesus corrected this type of thinking in John 14, 21. And let's read this together, John 14, 21. It's the next PowerPoint slide. John 14, 21, uh, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And in, in John 14, 21, let's, what do you tell them? Yeah. Jesus said this, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Yeah, if you would, just indulge me. Repeat after me, please. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Jesus says, he who has my commandments, he who has my commandments. Uh, let me see your Bibles. Let's do what we did before. If you got your Bible, hold it up. Hold up your Bibles. Okay? Wow. Some of you guys, Dr. Che, it's a miracle here. Some people's their Bibles are so small, they're almost invisible. You, you know? Invisible Bibles. Amazing. Jesus said, he who has my commandments. My commandments. Now, who wrote your invisible Bible? Okay? Who wrote your invisible Bible? Jesus said, he who has my commandments. Okay, he who has my commandments and keeps them, keeps them. Now, how do we keep Jesus' commandments? How do we keep Jesus' commandments? Jesus is talking more than just about owning a Bible, and you should have a Bible. But owning a Bible and going to church and looking like a Christian, check out, I wore a suit today, okay? I look good. Do I look like a preacher? It's more than just looking the part and going to church and having a Bible. He who has my commandments and keeps them. It means obeying his commandments, living, saying, yes, this is the way I need to live my, live, live my life. I'm going to obey Christ. I'm going to live by the precepts in this book. And look at the benefit he, there is. He says this, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. 
is the one that loves me. Church members, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? And he says the, the, the result here is love. Do you know how incredible that is? Love. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he goes on and he says, um, and he says, and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him. Now look at the image there. He who loves me, Jesus is speaking, okay? He who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him. Okay, one, two, three. You see, not religion, relationship. Relationship. In what type of a relationship? Love. Love. What is love? Is it abstract concept? Or is there a real world impact to it? What is love? Okay, I have two children here today. Two children. Lift your arm up. Wave. Okay, that's my two. Those are my two children. Now, listen, Rachel and Josiah, uh, you know, you guys are kind of annoying, okay? So, look, when we leave here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop you off by the road, and I don't want to see you for another week, okay? I'm not going to give you any money, okay? Maybe you can go to Philip's mom's house, okay? But I'm not going to give you any money. I'm not going to pay for any food. I'm not going to buy you any clothes, and I'll see you in a week, okay? And what if that was my habit? What if, I, what if that's the way that I treated them? What would people's opinion be of Robert? He's a what? He's a good dad? No, he's a bad father. Robert doesn't love his kids. He treats them poorly. He who has my commandments and, and keeps them is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. Loved by God. Real world impact. Loved by God. And he goes on, he says, and will I will disclose myself to him. I will disclose myself to him. You scientists that are here, the scientific method, scientific inquiry, you want to discover something, right? You want to learn something. You want to discover something about the physical world. Jesus says here that he will share himself with the one that loves him. He will reveal to that person what? who loves him and is loved by him and his father. So many new truths and so many new things that they never knew. I, I've, I've shared this with you before. In America 130 years ago, anyone could be a doctor. Anyone could be a doctor. There wasn't any really formal medical, standardized medical training. Anyone at all could be a doctor. There was no knowledge of the microscopic world. I can't see it, so it, it doesn't exist. H1N1? What are you, are you kidding me? I, show me H1N1. Okay, pianist, show me H1N1. You can. Oh, I don't believe it. I can't see it. And then guess what? They, they start to use microscopes, and they discover, they discover a world that for, what, tens of thousands of years, human beings never knew. It's there all along. It was there all along, but I didn't know it was there. And it revealed a, a, a world that people did not know. Scripture in Jeremiah 33, verses 2 and 3. This is the Lord speaking, and that Jeremiah uh, speaks, and, uh, and God speaks through Jeremiah saying this, Thus says the Lord, who made the earth, the Lord who formed, who formed it and established it. The Lord is his name. Let's stop there. Emphasis, the Lord 
the Lord, the Lord, Jehovah, creator. In fact, John chapter 1 said of Jesus uh, that all things came into being by him. And apart from him, nothing came into being. He is the creator, the voice of creation. Jesus was involved in creation, had an integral part. Jeremiah, once again, the Lord, thus says the Lord who made the earth, the one who formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. And that, what, is it, what does he say? He gives you an invitation. Call to me. Call to me. And I will what? Answer you. And I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. Relationship. You can have a relationship with the creator of the universe. Next Sunday, we're going to go out and we're going to see, you know, mountains and the changing of the leaves. That's God. That's God's work. You can have a relationship with that God that created all this. You can have a personal relationship with that. What kind of relationship? A loving relationship. And what's he say here? Call to me and I will answer you. We worry about in it. We worry about nuclear nuclear weapons and all kinds of things like that today, and biological warfare, and you know, powerful man-made things, folks. The most powerful force in all the universe is prayer. Why? Because we are in a loving relationship with a loving heavenly Father that cares for us that the burdens of our hearts, he wants to know. And we can make our needs and our requests known to the very God of the universe. And he will answer our prayers. And as he says here, I'll show you great and mighty things. Things which you did not know. I met a lady yesterday, 52 years old, and she is on a mission trip here to Korea and this lady talked about her life and she's had a difficult life divorced twice and uh, a child and her hobby if you would is to work go to the bar and drink and have relationships and that's the way she lived her life in 52 years of age and in most of her life, she had been in and out of church. And it was just, just recently that she began to do what Jesus said about he who has my commands and keeps them. He is, is the one who loves me. She became more dedicated in her walk with Christ and she gave up all that. And she shared that she doesn't have any more desire to go to the bar, any more desire to drink. And for her to take, for you and I that travel quite a bit, it's, it's not that big a deal to get on a plane and go across. For her, it is a huge thing for her to get on a plane and come to Korea and to come on a Christian mission trip. And she said, I'm just now discovering the life that God wanted me to have all along. And with regret, she said, I, why did I wait so long? I'm 52 years old. Why did I wait so long to begin this type of a close walk with Christ? But you see, she did not discover the things that God wanted to show her until she got into right relationship with him until she got into a right mindset that she would live for God. And now she said, like she said yesterday, I, pray, I just prayed and said, God, you take control of my life. You lead me, you guide me. And she's amazed because even in that, that, from the point of that prayer to now, God is just opening up her eyes and she's having so many new experiences. And again, she said, oh, why didn't I make that decision years ago? Why did I wait so long? Last presidential election in the United States, the winning campaign had a slogan. And the slogan went, yes, we can.
Yes, we can. Let's say that with me. Yes, we can. Humbundo. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And that became the winning slogan for Barack Obama's campaign. Well, God wants, you, God wants to help you in the midst of your struggles. God wants to help you in the midst of the struggles. We heard a testimony already about how God was helping Sun Jin. Let me ask you, do you feel like giving up? I, I, what I said before is so true. I'm 40, how old? 47 now. From teenagers, your, your teens, your 20s, 30s, 40s, and I know beyond. My dad's 81 this week. Every stage of life, it brings new challenges, different challenges. It never gets easier. It never gets easier. There's challenges all the way through. But God wants to help you. Do you feel like giving up? Do you feel sometimes that you're like in, like in the middle of that ocean, hanging on to that life preserver, and just hoping that somebody's going to come and help you? Did you have the temptation to just let go? And just let go and give up? Or maybe you're, you feel like you're over that gorge in Tanzania, just hanging, just hanging, and looking down and say, oh my gosh, it's so deep. It's, I'm, I, I don't know how much longer I can hold on. And you feel like what? Letting go? Or maybe the ladder has slipped and you're hanging on to the roof there. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Will somebody help me? Is, is this it? Is this over? I mean, am I, going to, am I going to die right here? Well, the message I have for you today is to hold on. Don't let go. Don't give up. Help is on the way. Help is on the way. And in stay, in, instead of saying, yes, we can... Say, yes, he can. Let's say that together. Yes, he can. It's talking about God. God wants to help you. God wants to be what we say, God wants to be with you 24-7. You're never alone. You're never alone. He wants to help you in provide for every need and he'll be with you during those difficult times folks we are we can't help ourselves we are we we know this is god's word okay i want to be a good christian but we're also emotional creatures we're also emo we have a spiritual part emotional part we can't help it when we're in situations these students that have what they have what sukje they have homework Guess what? It has to be done. It doesn't magically happen. Actually, Philip's mom and I, we didn't know each other. We were at Shinhagwan. We were at the seminary in America together at the same time. At that time, that was, yeah, Sun Jin, let me tell you about my time. When I was, actually, her dad was also at the same seminary too. Um, when I was a seminary student, and Rachel was a baby, I don't know, she's so-so. But, when she, but we working two part-time jobs, actually three part-time jobs, paying out, making $800 a month, paying out $1,100 in bills. And then Rachel got sick, was in the hospital for a week, like a 104 degree fever. Uh, later on, my wife was in the hospital, had to have an operation. We had the world's worst insurance ever. We had to, our deductible could have been $11,500. I mean, no money. Uh, plus, guess what? I've got all this work to do for seminary, my graduate school. And the pressure was enormous. And it just, I had people stop by, I had people stop me on campus and say, man, I don't know how you're handling it. If I was facing what you were facing, I would just be an emotional wreck. 
And it was, sometimes you get into your life where it's not day by day, it's hour by hour. And you're just asking God to help you. And it was like somebody blowing up a balloon, the, the pressure. You know, you blow a balloon and you blow it and blow it and you see the kids and they blow it, blow it, blow it and what happens? They go too far and, and it felt like that. And I know I called my pastor my my home church in Tennessee and I, and I just said, pray for me. And he said, okay, let's pray. And we prayed right there on the phone. And as we were praying, you know what? All that tension, it, all that tension began to drain away. Just like in the balloon, you let the air out, what? It collapses. And that's what happened. And God just gave me assurance it's going to be okay now. Guess what? I had to go to my professors and I say, look, you know, I can't get my work done on time. Will you give me an extension or whatever else? You know, and I hated, actually, I, I was under so much pressure at that time. I, I didn't really like seminary and graduate school. Um, and I was ready to, you know, I was ready to be done. And I'm thinking, oh, if I can't get my work done, it means I have to stay another semester. And they gave me an extension for some courses. But I tell you, I want to tell you something. Just like I'm, I, okay, I'm thirsty. I need to drink water. I want to tell you, with every bit of my humanness, I did not want to do that homework. I did not want to do those papers. I did not want to do it. But I knew that God wanted me to do it. And I did it. And we got through that time with the help of God. And that was... That was, without a doubt, one of the most stressful, probably one of the most stressful times we've had. And it's, it's no fun. I mean, it's no fun. Maybe women can understand this, but men are providers for the family. You don't have, you're not, you don't have enough money to provide. And it, it, it can affect your psyche and affect your self-esteem. But sometimes God allows us to get into that point where we, you can do nothing but trust. And God got me through that. I never want to go through it again, but I'll tell you, you're a stronger person once you go through it. And God will take care of you no matter what you face, no matter the circumstances. Yes, He can. Say it one more time. Yes, He can. But you know, if you say, yes, He can, then we have to say, yes, I will. Say it with me. Yes, I will. We have, to, we have to say to God, yes, I will. We have to give ourselves totally to Christ, totally to Jesus. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. We have to say, yes, I will trust you to take care of me. Yes, I will live my life according to your truth. You got your invisible Bibles? Okay, throw them away and pick up one of these, okay? Yes, I will make my life's goal to have a close relationship with you. Yes, I will never give up despite any difficulties. Yes, I will hang on. Let's pray together.